So welcome to yeah. This is the last talk before the beer or yeah. So you know it's only me <laughs> between the, the after party and yeah. So welcome to the talk. The dark side of Kotlin. Uh, we love dark side. Who love who loves dark side? Yeah. Who loves Kotlin? Oh, <laughs> okay, okay, great. <laughs> so yeah, about me a little bit. Jarek Ratajski, yeah, I've been coding like a uh, bigger piece of part of my life. I've forgotten the times where I wasn't coding. Uh, my Pokemons include Java, C++, Scala, Kotlin, TypeScript, and Haskell. Currently, I work for a company called Digital Asset where I mostly work with Scala. That's why I love recently Kotlin more sometimes, but uh, honestly, I still love Scala. But yeah, it's like if you don't touch something for a while, it becomes nice, you know, memory from childhood or something like that. However, the talk mostly concentrates on my experience from the past companies when I was introducing uh, Kotlin to, to for several projects, uh, customers, and also talks with different dev coders, not only from my teams, also from like other companies, even people I kind of consulted, like even like on a on uh, social media, etc. Et so basically, I was gathering what problems there are, etc. But uh, uh, you know, who is a little bit tired? Who is uh, you are tired? So like, we we can now do this e uh, exercise. Like you can stand and do it, do something like this. Like try this, try this. Uh, I I have to say, yeah, great, thanks. That was awesome. Like it honestly, it won't help. But it will help me later. I, I needed that. I, I needed to see who will get to the point of this presentation. But it's very Im important. So, abstraction. We often talk about abstraction in coding. But who can explain me what the abstraction is? Okay. No, we'll not waste your time. I will not convince that I am smarter by uh, uh, by knowing what the abstraction is. I copied it from Wikipedia. So, abstraction is basically a process. Yeah, when we analyze something and classify and we get on the end abstraction so basically it's funny because the both the process so how we get there and the end result is abstraction and if my reasoning my explanation what actually is ex is comes from the etymology from the original meaning of the word so abstraction is separation it's like subtraction it's more or less the same meaning you take something away so in abstraction, we take away details to get some more generic thing. And now comes the question, why do we do that? Like, why do we even bother? And then there is like this picture, like your mind, like we are humans, and even AI struggles with juggling multiple things at a time. We can concentrate, we can keep in head pictures that are only as much complicated. Like the more things on the picture, the more we are lost. Yeah, when you are lost in the code, typically it means like mm, it's basically too much. And how we can reduce how many things we see? Yeah, we use abstraction. So for instance, this is like a process of doing something. Create memory booth, buffer, open config file, uh, read file into buffer, blah blah, check connections, create memory buffer. You Remember, maybe you have to free memory buffer. You, if you are a C++ C developer, you have to free memory sometimes. In Java, we never free. It's so great. OK. But, and you know, 300 such steps, and at the end, it was all because we are sending SMTP email. So one of the basic forms of abstraction that we learn as a programmers is to sub our procedures, functions, methods. We just extract this. Like, this whole thing we will name send email to SMTP, we'll find those are arguments, subject, uh, recipient, etc. Uh, some parts of it will like maybe find IP, will introduce another small methods, functions. And this is like an extracting method is a form of abstraction. Also the result that this code is now, for instance, shows only the, the big picture that we are sending email in few steps. This is also like abstraction. Things are hidden, but they are still still existing there, inside. So th this is the point. This is the way. See the bigger picture, and forget about details. Mm. And one problem is that you have to understand this. You have to understand how this process works. I remember in my first company, 
when I was wor working professionally, I was using, m introducing multiple methods and my colleagues were angry because they were like having this comments like here ends if that I started in line 2003 and you know, and then 3000 lines of something. And when I was extracting methods, they were telling that my code is crazy. They cannot follow it. They have to jump. This is crazy. What you are doing, Jarek? Yeah, so some people, there are some, like, and, but I would say in the year 2023, almost every developer understands the concept of jumping to a method and method or function as an abstraction. In the past, it was a little bit more crazy. But yeah, th there are like more, the other, there are other ways of abstracting, not only by extracting a method, more complex. And you have to, if you use this abstraction, particle abstraction, you have to understand how it works. The people that are looking at your code have to understand. And basically abstraction, why we do that? Because this is investment. We now spend more time by, for instance, this extracting or by learning something. And in the future, like, it will be easier to maintain the code. But you know what happens with investments, yeah? They fail sometimes. Happens. Yeah, so this is the one line of code in Java. We start with Java, so, so lightly. This is hash map URL to string. And it will be like, we are building some cache. So we are querying some URLs, and we cache response body. So the next time we query the same URL, we just give the same body because we already had it. What is already wrong with this picture? Who knows where this fails? Okay, oh no, no, I only see experts like <laughs> you. Uh, okay, that's 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 a fair point, but that's not what I meant. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm not storing this. Okay, but let's suppose that we only store when it succeeds, when that doesn't, we just do not. Where is the problem? Okay, like I, I, Peter, expert. Yeah, so we all know this abstraction as developer hash map. It's a magic box. We don't think how it works. We put keys, then we query by the keys. Sometimes we understand that when we query by the skis, there are two methods important for those objects. Which, are, which two methods are important for URL here in this picture? Yeah, equals and hash code. They, they govern how these things are stored in hash. But we don't worry, forget about it, because we, we assume it works. But the point is that the, you know, the, the URL is a very tricky class. It's from Java Net URL. And you know, it's a tricky class. Uh, yeah, and everyone uh, expects that it works sanely, like equals is a quite normal method that compares the string that is URL and hash code the same. But you know, it cannot be sane because it was created by the people that created Java. So it's like, so actually what can happen here in the picture, the, um, you put some like, you queried some adult page, not for kids, and you never want the kids to show, to see this body. Yeah, not for kids, but then you qu query this by get, and there is obviously a page for kids, and I could show you that it would actually present you exactly the result from before. Why? Because in some circumstances, equals hash content URL actually querying DNS. So every time you'd call equals, potentially <laughs> DNS can be queried, actually real network call, and check for the real IP. And then this class assumes if the IP matches, then you're querying for the same. This is completely broken, normally, for instance, because something like virtual hosts exist, so the same, the different domains share the same IP. It's all broken here because of this, but okay. And particularly, this often happens when you have URL and you, find, you see the problem in performance, because this querying also costs a lot. Or you, or you are behind firewalls and this query actually is blocked. Yeah? So th this is funny thing. So this is the moment where abstraction leaks. Where you expect something, a small detail works without problems, but then you had to get, and it's some, maybe you will even waste hours finding out what's wrong here, because you would never expect that such, so, such a simple thing can fail. So, the original goal for this talk was to bash Kotlin, to show how bad it is. It's like, because I like bash, bashing stuff, but I must have, through the years, I became kind of a Kotlin fanboy, so I cannot fully do that. 
sorry if, if you wanted like to hear how bad Kotlin is. I will show you some example and honestly I will still justify why. Sorry for that. But okay, so I am Kotlin fanboy, I have to confess. Even like so. But the, my message from this that Kotlin is not a better Java. It's something different. Because sometimes I see this, like, why bother? Because even my IntelliJ, what, what IntelliJ even can do for you, you write Java, then automatically it even shows you this Java in a Kotlin syntax, and you can transform one to one between the one another. So just Kotlin is a little bit more concise um, way of writing Java. That's it. So you can even like translate one to one, the, uh, both ways. If you, if you think Kotlin is like that, then you are basically not using Kotlin like, you are not using the potential of Kotlin. It only actually makes sense when you write a code in Kotlin that you would never write in Java because it makes no sense in Java. Okay, because in Kotlin we have uh, many more abstractions, the forms of abstractions that we can use. And by the way, it's not that Kotlin is magic, like some genius people like created it. They had they had it much easier because Java was created in the middle of 90s and Kotlin uh, almost 15 years later. It's like they could gather experience from different languages. I would say the most did uh, definitely Scala. Kotlin is kind of Scala minus minus, where Scala experimented and at the end Kotlin showed well, this is this we like, we don't like this, but that's call it Kotlin. Scala minus minus. Also a little bit of groovy, etc. But one thing is what I really love about Kotlin is that it's actually less complex than Java. It's a smaller language in terms, of, in terms of how many grammatical rules you have. Uh, and here is, for instance, an example, because it was designed later. So you know that Java has the var keyword, yeah? So you, don't, you have type inferences. Actually, in a few places in Java, you have type inferences. But about var, I actually do not really like what happens in Java, that you can use var inside of the body of the method, but nowhere else. Here in Kotlin, you can you use var for a field, so you can infer you have t type inference that you can use there. You obviously you can use it in a method and even as an argument for a constructor. When you put a var as a constructor argument, just a top line here, it automatically becomes a field. So just a shortcut, yeah. And the point is not that it is short to write it this way. It is, but it's just one simple rule: var field name variable name, whatever, potentially colon type, because optionally type. In some places you have to put the type, but there is just one syntactic rule. I like it. And there are more points, and I will not concentrate how why null safety is so cool that you, we don't have to deal with this dualism of uh, primitive type, object types. Uh, one thing, who have had this experience that if you do generics in Kotlin, there are somehow much easier to use than in Java, and you don't know why. Had anyone this experience? Okay, this is like, I, I've heard it from a few people, like somehow we switch to Kotlin, we do the same generic code, but now it's somehow easier. But we cannot explain it, but the explanation is here, declaration side variance, so where you use this, uh, s you remember from Java this super extends question mark, something, something, you, when you work with generics, in Kotlin, they use it differently, but there is like different approach where you put that information. And it's basically C sharp also went this way as Kotlin. It's so much easier to use. And at the end, like small things like unit instead of void, which again makes everything like more regular. But okay, what I will show you is mostly magic in this talk. So first thing from Kotlin that you may look at and if you are especially like newcomer and you see and question what is this? So who knows what is this after the colon? X colon and now int arrow string. What is this? What, yeah? Lambda. Lambda. Ah, here is the better because lambda is actually an object that a function that we can call. That's not really yet a function. This is the type. Yeah, so this is a function type. So someone, this is the type. So int is a type, string a type, and int arrow string is also a type, a function type. So, by the way, this is something we can call type constructor. So from one type, we create another, and Java also have it. We, do we remember the primitive arrays in Java with uh, square brackets? So it's also, you have something like int, and now you construct other type with putting these brackets. From 
from int you create array of int, from user you create array of user. Here, from having int and string, we create function that takes int and returns string. And yeah, this is a type. And obviously, uh, when we have type, we can assign the lambda to it. Exactly. So it was for lambda. So n that yeah wraps the n in braces. This is at the end lambda. And in Java, we would write it this way: function from int to string. We create a name. We have this function. And yeah, so this is like very corresponding. But why is this beautiful? Why well, there's nothing new? But who has seen those types? Yeah. Many times in what is the difference between supplier of integer and factory of integer? Basically, bo all these types, four names, uh, five names I use, they are basically of the same in type in Kotlin. From nothing, you create int, so something that produces int. But if we, you are in Java, we have to use one of those names. And a few times I was seeing like a wrapper, because one, one class gives me a, a callback, from integer and another expects supplier of integer. And that's that's funny funny moment, yeah, when you wrap one lambda into another. Nothing, not a complex thing, but yeah, why we even should we do that when we can have a perfectly working function type? Cool. But it's only starting here. So we have a function type. So how many ways we in how many ways we can write lambda in Kotlin? So this is the first way. Into string lambda. I presented F1, F2 into string, but I write fun, and in, by the way, fun is how you define functions. It's a lot of fun, yeah? Fun, n on int, and it's more or less corresponding. It's the way to write, by the way, this fun can be uh, also like a top-level function, and we'll see that. So here is a function uh, I call wrap from n to int string. This is just this, this first two three lines. This is a normal function, and then I, using uh, method reference, function reference, I assign it again to F3. So I have shown you three ways to define a lambda. So, and even I would say whenever I work with JavaScript, I was always complaining that there are so many ways how can I write a function. It's again here a problem a little bit of Kotlin, but we'll see where it ends a little bit later this uh, variety. The, OK. So if it is a type, maybe we can inherit from that. Can we inherit from this function type like this? Who knows? Yeah, it's perfectly valid. It's a normal, it, yeah. It's a normal type. You can <laughs> inherit from that. Yeah, so OK, the I see, yeah. Then you have this special method invoke. What it does, I will show, so basically we, uh, we can all always call it like that, x, I invoke 10, and it actually will do what we want, but actually we will do this, x of 10, what is this? So we have object x, and now instead of calling a function on this, putting argument, we directly use this object as a function, as a lambda actually. So now, because we inherited from function type, let's say, Lambda type, now our object, even though we define the normal class for it, it behaves like lambda, and we use here something called operator overloading. You know? who? So, and we have also possibility to overload other operators, like uh, plus, minus, etc. I will not show that today, but you know, who has heard about this, uh, you know, ancient C++ developers, like, working, yeah, with, uh, you loved it, operator overloading? <laughs> so I was when I was using operator overloading in C++ in 90s, there were tons of stories like development stopped for two months and every, no one knows what is going on because someone overloaded like a star operator, which is even more complex what it actually does. But you know, it's like no one knows what's going on. Suddenly the code doesn't work. You look at the code, yeah, it's, it's uh, perfectly sane. But yeah, this symbol now means something different. Cool. But Kotlin went this way. And you know, it can be abused. It can definitely be abused. And I can say in the 90s, when we, were f when we found that we can overload operators, we were ob abusing it a lot. But I think in the next 20 years, we learned some things about, you know, clean code, the way we work, that, that we should do reviews, etc. that code should be readable, not hacky, that maybe now developers as a community are mature enough to give them 
this possibility to overload operators. And especially that it's, yeah, it, you ca it can be abused, but how many times you played, for instance, with Java and big decimals? I, when you work for banks, yeah, you have some operation with big decimals. Does it look good? It looks ugly. Is it actually safe? It's totally unsafe. There are multi I multi I've seen multiple bugs made uh, when some people operated on big decimals not having operator overloading because code becomes so unreadable that it's so easy to make a mistake. So I would say even Java would benefit if there were some small possibilities to use operator overloading. For some, oh, it was defined. <laughs> okay. Uh, now comes funny part. So we have a list, uh, we have a function wrapper that takes a list of integers. And we, we, we still pursue this function type, int to string. And we have argument into string. Well, basically, we have a list of integers. And each of these integers, we will just, with this recipe, we'll change to string, and then we'll create one big string. Yeah? So how it works, so for instance, we uh, have this uh, one, seven, uh, oh, sorry, minus one list. And each of those elements we'll just put inside stars, and we'll get this string with uh, star one inside stars, seven inside stars, minus one inside stars. Very simple thing. But do you see the difference with between this and this picture? There is a slight difference. OK, look at this picture and look the other, uh, how is Rob Al called with how many arguments at the end. So if you are a Kotlin developer, you've probably seen that a lot of times. But OK, I will show you this way. Yeah, th this is one. So look at the second part at the almost last line, just above println. How many arguments are, uh, I I with how many arguments wrap all function is called? Two. Two. OK, because I see one, one list. Where is the second one? Yeah. Kotlin has this funny syntax rule that I told you that is very regular, but sometimes it's actually not. That if the last argument to the method is a lambda, you can put it outside braces. You start with curly braces. So yeah, technically this is th those both uh, um, both uh, um, both codes are basically doing the same. They are corresponding. They are exactly generate the same code. Uh, bytecode, let's say, but you know, when you look at it, it's uh, in sh for the first time it looks really crazy. Why would I put argument outside of the yeah, braces that I call it with? It's uh, crazy, okay. And you know, it's a gift. Uh, for instance, I like this. I told you that Kotlin is very regular in syntax. Yeah, and the var is var everywhere in the same. So if I have if, and I want to. If and some condition, Boolean condition, like, and I want to assign either one or two, like if condition is true, then one, uh, otherwise two. Then I can write it always this way. Yeah, a2 equals if. So by the way, this is again, this is actually point for Kotlin, simple syntax. You have if that works both as a statement and as an expression. Kotlin doesn't need this ternary, like question mark something, which looks crazy. One if does both things, which is cool. And if condition, then either one or two. So, yeah, in a, so I can I can use this this way. Yeah, cool. Why not? But what if my a one is actually a lambda? So from nothing to in a supplier. So if I use it as a statement, a one equals supplier of one, or e, uh, or a one e equals supplier of two, it would work. But if I use it this way, uh, Kotlin must be regular. Like uh, I. It actually won't even compile. Why? So yeah, someone found out that what would be that would be a tricky for a regular developer if, like after you know conditioning in, in if you typically start with curly braces as statements, and this time it would be a lambda. So they put a special exception. If this is just inside if, this curly brace is never a lambda. It's always a statement. And here we'll get a message that, yeah, you cannot, uh, it was expected uh, a lambda, but I got a statement. It won't compile. You can fix it, putting just this small arrow. Then it, oh, then compile will know, oh, okay, you actually wanted lambda. This is a special exception to exception. Uh, cool. Yeah, I love when you 
design your compiler so well that you have to put then exceptions to exceptions a great. Good job, but it's, uh, it's not a big deal. This is a funny story, like something that I call the baptism of every Kotlin developer. Every Kotlin developer at one point will waste some hours on this. So the point is we have a function print with love that basically takes a string and wraps it, pu puts a heart in front of it. We have the string interpolation, the same as in uh, newest Java. And then we have a function that actually uh, takes a lambda and basically calls this lambda with a string. So this is just some uh, magic like wrapping one in another. This is basically the, the, the result should be obvious. We can call it this way, grid conference in braces. I put in curly braces lambda, so I put a lambda as an argument. Or I can actually, I told you, there is this special rule. I d if this is the last argument, and lambda is actually first and the last, so I can skip the braces. I can put start with curly braces. OK, I can do this. Then I can do this, curly braces, but I will use it. And Kotlin have this, if the lambda has only one argument, I don't have to repeat it from x, do print, love, uh, print with love with x, I just call, use this it magic keyword that represent a single argument. And I can use curly braces and I could use method reference, or I can use normal braces and method reference. And I was happily writing these five things, and then I only shown, I have seen only four hearts. My heart is broken. It's not enough love for the conference. Who knows where is the error? Yeah, there? But where? You, you, what? Yeah, you, you, yeah? What nine nine? Line, line nine, yeah. So line nine, okay. <laughs> this line is wrong because curly braces means lambda and method reference means lambda. So actually I called the lambda that inside creates a lambda, doesn't do anything with that actually. So it's not called, so this is one wrong line and basically I've seen in a few places people really wasting hours and saying like, like, I'm insane, the world stopped working. This is such a simple code. I have two lines, they do not work. God help me, yeah? It's like, but you know, first time you waste like few hours, the next time you waste an hour and then you learn it. But it's all, I would say, if we have this, my, uh, my opinion on that, if we have this it, which I actually like, the method reference in Kotlin is kind of redundant. It makes not much sense, it's just a copy from Java, and it only brings confusion. But okay, this is my, I would basically say, don't use it, yeah. The question is, why Kotlin has all these fancy rules? Like, why it introduced these rules that actually are kind of dangerous sometimes? Moment, just checking time. So, yeah, look at this, because there is explanation. I can explain Kotlin. Have you ever worked with JSON this way? Like you create programmatically JSON. Funny, yeah? You, you obviously see which JSON is created. You, from the picture, it's easy to see. Okay, it's easy to see that such a JSON is created, like uh, article, pierogi, yeah, whatever. But what if we could just write it like that? Wouldn't it be nice if we, in this few places in code when we have to actually manually write programmatically JSON, we would just write it almost as it looks. It would be nice, yeah? So I can tell you it's not fully possible, but this is something you can get with, uh, get with uh, uh, Kotlin relatively easily, like this. You see, there is no colon, but if you do, you remember this exercise, two dots look from this perspective as a colon. So, but this really, this look, uh, and there is like, oh, so th there are two small problems, like two dots look like a colon, but okay, you, you have to, you, if you have a monitor with pivot, it does job. And also, in front of this uh, square brace, which start array, we have this error. It could be whatever name, but it has to be something. It can just be just, in Kotlin, it cannot be just a square brace. And I will skip you how I achieved that operator overlonging, all these things that we've seen before, this stupid tricks with syntax that, uh, the, okay, stupid, this, this interesting uh, syntax in that Kotlin has enables you to do this. 
And maybe in places where you need to introduce this domain-specific language, something, you can do it. But what if I could tell you that with the help of these guys, Mongols, that's how I, I look, uh, draw me Mongols, I would say pretty, pretty OK. I'm not sure about the bows, but OK. What we actually, thanks to those people, have, we have alphabet in Unicode. And this Mongolian alphabet has one great thing, a letter which is inside these square braces. A letter which is invisible. It's kind of between white space and, and the letter. Why it's important? Because everything that is not totally white space and is a letter can be used as an identifier. Actually, also in Java, but especially in Kotlin. So you know where I'm going. <laughs> I created a method that actually has this empty, empty letter name. And now I solve the problem. Also, but uh, you see also the proper colon. Well, it's not the colon, but trust me, I searched Unicode, and I think Aramaic, uh, Syriac, a few languages actually have a letter that looks like colon. Done. <laughs> it's done. OK. Honestly, probably never do that in code. So someone can inherit this code from you and will basically find your address and will kill you. So don't do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so basically, okay, do I have see it here? Right, oh, okay. So here is range two. So in, 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 in Kotlin, you have this possibility to declare array from 1 to 10, 1 dot dot 10. It will create, and this is a range two operator that you can actually define what it does on your own. Here it's defined, okay. And you say, from this perspective, is a colon. I tried it. OK. OK, we are slowly getting to the end. Uh, how many minutes I have? OK. So, but you know, this is the point. With all these tricks in the syntax, we can create powerful DSLs, the like sub-languages that, in particular contexts, are useful. Not that we, every Kotlin project, is using that features, creating DSL. No, no, no. We only use it uh, for special like libraries that are often used. For instance, Cotest. This is how you can introduce easily uh, Kotlin for a company. Like, I can write something much smarter than your JUnit. Instead of creating this crazy method, does this, when this, and you put this as a method name, just write a string. And with substring, it looks so nice. And, and then you have this something should be zero or whatever. This looks, at least for me, so much nicer than typical JUnit because of this freedom of the syntax that I, I, the, the, the creators of the library created for me. The same here, ktor, so how we define rest endpoints. Instead of crazy annotations that are scanned during the build time or run time, this is just the language. This actually you can run and debug how it works. And you can do crazy stuff like put it into a little loop. Why not? So, and there is more. Polymorphism, this is, this is the part. Like, uh, polymorphins, you probably think when you, mm, there are actually multiple types of polymorphisms, but one thing of pol one type of polymorphisms that people know is subtype polymorphism. Yeah? So interface and uh, interfaces, basically, or um, uh, inheritance uh, of classes. But, and these polymorphisms work well, but has one problem, which I call deserialization disaster, or ca from JSON catastrophe. And my explanation is like, if you have, well, for, for a moment, think that there are no magic libraries that, when you have an object, will create magically JSON for you. Such because, OK, for JSON, this is solved, but there are multiple other formats which this thing is not solved. So maybe you would like to create something like interface JSON serializable that you have this method to JSON, which creates string. And then maybe you create a method that serializes list, list of some T that will create a JSON string only if this object inside is JSON serializable. So we create a class person, say it's JSON serializable, inherits JSON serializable, implements actually, and we implement this to JSON method and we are done. This would work well and nice. What's the problem? Problem is from JSON. How would you even do that? If we put interface like JSON deserializable that, the deserializable that has method from JSON, it already looks crazy. So if I write it for a class like user, I would need first instance of user, then I would call deserialize on that, oh, that's, and then I will get another user. This looks stupid, yeah? Obviously, so, yeah. 
And no matter what you try, this is a disaster with interfaces. So basically, the, what the, the point is, like when, when language sucks, face you, you use design patterns. OK. So we can use something, let's call it strategy. So we crea create an interface JSON support, which has two methods, two JSON from JSON. And now it's obvious. If we have a class person, we create some, by the way, singleton for this. This is the JSON support for person. It has two methods. And then we have this method with list. We just pass a second argument, JSON support. And we are done. This would work. It works. It's nothing wrong with this picture. Yeah, so. But the point is, this is still a little bit artificial. Like, we now used some, what if it was supported by the language? So, and it is actually by Kotlin. And uh, there is a concept called type class. And it was like via backdoor introduced to Kotlin. So what if you just, for each class, create this JSON support? Because what is the problem? This is a small problem, but every time you call this, and potentially this is like long hierarchy of objects, big, big hierarchy. Every time you have to pass this argument, my JSON deserialization, my JSON support objects, maybe a list of them. Yeah, there is always this problem. But what if compiler could decide, oh, I need this JSON support for user, now I need JSON support for car, now I need JSON support for company, because I know it from context. And compiler typically can... Uh, uh, can infer it. So, and there is this thing. It's uh, this line context, JSON support of T. The serialized array. If only T has this JSON support, like, and then you can actually call it. Yeah, this is great. Actually, this, no, uh, sorry, this after F JSON support is not needed. So here is a, uh, I wrote it from by hand and I made a mistake. Now I've seen it for the first time. This JSON support uh, just after fun is not really needed here. But okay, it's needed in this context. Now, compiler in the last line, there is this from JSON, and, com and compiler knows that call from JSON from the corresponding uh, uh, context that is actually fitting to the type of T. And what you only then have to do somewhere, you, ha you have to create those classes like person JSON support, and you use with with. You basically, you, you put somewhere on top of your maybe in main with this supports blah, blah, this and this and this, call the rest of your code. And it basically does the thing. So, and other thinking of that, type classes, what you've seen this, like are interfaces on steroids. Because interface, it means I have from the context, I can call everything on the instance of object of some type. Type classes is, I don't actually not even need an, I need a type, T, something, but I don't need an instance. It can be like, like infant interface that works on static members. This is more how you can think of, of uh, type classes. And if you think this way, this is a very powerful uh, abstraction, form of abstraction that you can use that will make your code much simpler, but all, on the other hand, people will have to learn what the hell is type class. Yeah? Uh, as always, the cost. And by the way, this is what I learned from internet. If you maybe jump to Scala, where this complex, uh, this this um, thing type class is used, just write it differently with implicit. It becomes suddenly ugly, unreadable, and unmaintainable. No one knows why. It's just magic. But okay, I'm using Scala. For me, it works. But I don't know. Maybe because I'm wizard. Okay. And one last thing here from from this is. Flap map uh, hell. That now, now for, for the thing that I actually ha hate in Kotlin. I really, really hate it with passion. So maybe you had this interface like that returns either. So I want to, I have this code that uh, at the end, this method, notify admin, that from DB, I take the user of given ID, and maybe, maybe I'm getting this user, or I'm actually getting error. If I'm getting this user with a flat map, then I find the group that the user belongs to. But it can be also error. Maybe user is not in a group. If I have a group via next flat map, I find the admin. I look for admin of the group. Might exist, might not. If not, finally, I don't have admin of the group. I would say, sorry, no admin to notify. If, or potentially, I found the admin, I would send them an email, like, yeah, user misbehaves or whatever. So we have all of that because we have these three eaters. 
So it could be optional, by the way. Either is like optional that explain you why it didn't happen, for those that don't know. So, and we have this code, flat map, flat map. Mostly, if you did some reactive programming, you have seen this flat map hell on a much bigger scale. But there is a solution for that, because it can be written, uh, okay, this is the, the clue, this can be written this way. We, you, yeah, val user, and we use, where is the magic? This either the data error user kind of introduction, and then we open curly brace, and then every time we use this magic bind method. Who knows what construct, what syntax from Kotlin I have used here? And uh, the, the explanation is just at the beginning of this code. Yeah. What? Shout it, we don't have time. What? Yeah, I exactly used coroutines. What do you, are, do you think coroutines are designed for? Working yeah, working parallel threads. How many threads are there? There is, not a sing there is a single thread here involved in this code. There is absolutely no parallelism, no async. This is total abuse of the concept. <laughs> there is no concurrency. This is just typical, like, uh, very, uh, the, this flat map in this particular case was like very smart if statement that would, yeah, so to, to reduce if statement. But here we basically abused, actually, this, is, this was done by the Arrow KT library. Uh, they don't really comment that kind of uh, abuse anymore, but I actually liked it. And this is the only place where I find Kotlin coroutines are kind of useful. <laughs> because in the original context, they are, ho I would say, the worst uh, implementation of async I've ever seen. And it's, I even like more uh, uh, what they do in, uh, in JavaScript, non machining C sharp. And with Loom, which basically do green threads for you, it's even now more useless. But pe uh, on the other hand, I know that people love it. I don't understand those people. I block them on Twitter instantly. But OK, it's like, but I like to show this example, but this is very, very magic. And but I, would, I wish it died. <laughs> but OK. OK, so we'll just skip it. We'll get to the end. So everything comes a cost and suspend. Oh, one, one really, why I hate coroutines? Because you know what? Coroutines have this funny thing. Like if you have a suspend method, so you mark it can be used as a coroutine, you can only call it from other coroutine suspend method. You know what happens with a code? Everything becomes suspend, just in case. Someone would call suspend inside. But by the way, I first heard about in C sharp context that they have exactly the same problem. Everything is async just in case. So now everything becomes suspend, and in one moment you realize this is probably stupid. But the end it is, and uh, the best part of it, if you have a suspend method that declares that return integer, and you can actually tell it, uh, you call this method and you print it. And instead of, instead of integer, it will display you surprise, a string. And actually, this will be a string. This is the best job done by the Kotlin, where you can have, a, you have, have this type safety and everything, and method declares that returns int, but you can actually make it return string. Great job. Great, great. Oh, and by the way, you see here a little bit of magic. If you w create your own coroutine builders, and you deal with uh, coroutines, this is the error that actually can happen. That a method <laughs> that should return in return string, or basically type safety doesn't work anymore. So basically, because on the bytecode level, all these suspend methods actually return, no matter what they declare, they return object, and it can be in some places uh, basically abused, and you can actually return any object. This is really cool. Okay. so. But you know, with great power comes great responsibility. That is our Polish uh, like character from cartoon. Sorry for that. Well, how can we deal with that? There are linters. So when your language is a little bit too rich, what you can do, you can use linter. Just don't decide. We use this stuff, but don't this stuff. There is a great Kotlin linter that I recommend, detect. Who uses detect? You should if you don't. Basically, it has great defaults, and it, you can even at plugins, so for instance, I created a plugin for Kotlin that only allows you to write Haskell in Kotlin. I mean, 
You cannot use arrays, you cannot mutate variables, you cannot uh, uh, have uh, for loops, nothing. Everything is prohibited, just a pure code. And actually, I've written a few projects like that. It's so cool, you write, you write Haskell with Kotlin, it's possible, just for fun. OK, but the point at the end. Sometimes there are this moment, I'm I, want to I want to write the code, but this is, no matter what I try, it never looks good. Maybe it's time to change the language. There are two ways. In some languages, you, there is no escape. You have to change the language to something else. In some languages, those are rich enough, like Kotlin, maybe Scala, that they can actually be chameleons. You change them. You still this is still Kotlin, but looks different. And now you can express yourself. And yeah, okay, I will skip that because the time is over. Uh, and but remember, programming languages are not to make code shorter. This is just side effect. Yeah. It's to make less mistakes. Kotlin is, was introduced to make less mistakes than in Java and to be more expressive, to express more things. That So in moment that you have a Kotlin code, you translate it to Java and back and you get, get a gibberish thing, you are doing it right because that's how it's supposed to work. And yeah, that's, that's my message. Thank you. So just in case, I will be there if you have questions or you want to kill me or whatever. Uh, no, killing is not prohibited. It's not polite. <laughs>